Hey everyone, and welcome to this week's COVID-19 office hours. We have a lot of great content to get through today, so we're gonna get right to that, but just spend a moment going over some housekeeping and technical slides. So first and foremost, we are recording the office hours as we do each week, and we will post a copy of that recording along with the slides and the content from the chat box, all to the web link that's up there on your screen right now on the HUD Exchange, just to give us a few business days and we will get that posted uh, as soon as possible. If you have any audio issues during the webinar, we encourage you to switch over to phone audio. You can do so by calling in to the number that's showing up both on your screen right now on the slides and what is also appearing in the chat. If you have any issues connecting to the phone audio, um, just let us know and we'll do our best to support you. Everyone will remain muted for the duration of the webinar, but we do anticipate and hope to hear from you throughout using the chat feature. So to find the chat feature on your screen, just go ahead and look all the way over towards the right-hand side in WebEx, and you should see what looks just like a chat bubble. If you click on that, it'll open up the chat functionality for you. Please send all questions, comments, and feedback in through the chat. When you are sending us those messages, just take a moment to make sure that the two bar is selected to go to everyone. It should default to that, but if it does not, just scroll down just a little bit and you should see that. And with that, I'm gonna turn things over to Norm Suchar from HUD's Office of Special Needs Assistance Program. Norm. Thank you so much, Natalie. Uh, as Natalie mentioned, we have a packed uh, agenda today, so we're gonna just jump right into things. I expect we'll be here uh, for the full 90 minutes. Uh, again, a lot of really, really great content. So very excited to hear uh, from a lot of guest speakers. Today. So uh, from the SNAPS office, you'll be hearing me, Norm Suchar. Uh, we will also have uh, Marlisa Grogan and Sharon Singer will be uh, doing a couple presentations. We have several of our, oh, and Lisa Kaufman also uh, from our uh, SNAP staff. Uh, we have some presentations from our TA providers, Michelle Williams and Mary Frances Kenyon. Uh, and we have a couple great community presentations that we're very excited about. Uh, from uh, the Worcester City and County. Uh, you'll be hearing from uh, Leah Bradley, Dr. Maddie Castile, and uh, Jack Moran. Uh, and uh, you'll also be hearing from Dr. Deborah Furholden. Uh, they have some great uh, content on, on equity and vaccinations, uh, and we're very excited to have them uh, join today for our presentation. Uh, we will uh, hear our regular CDC update from Emily Masitis as well. Uh, so with that, we're gonna just jump right into things uh, as usual, and I'm very pleased to introduce Emily Masitis from the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention to give us our COVID update. Emily? Hi, everyone. So glad to be here. So I know we have um, a lot of great speakers, so I will give a brief update. Um, our cases continue their downward trajectory as we've had over the past few weeks, so very glad to report that the number of cases per day has continued to trend downward. Next slide. Um, vaccination, on the other hand, continues to trend upward. At this point now, we can see um, just a little bit of lag in the southern states, um, with Alaska continuing to lead the way in terms of vaccinations per capita. Next slide. So I wanted to draw attention to another morbidity mortality weekly report from CDC that is hot off the presses. It just came out today. This is the first month of COVID-19 vaccine safety monitoring in the United States. I know a lot of people, I'm sure, are very interested to see what does the safety um, information look like once we've started rolling this out. So this is, um, at the point at which they uh, did analysis for this, there were 13 million doses of vaccine that had been provided throughout the United States. Um, in terms of severe outcomes, there, well, let me just back up for a second just to say there are two systems that are collecting data on adverse reactions to vaccination. One is called VAERS, and that's the Vaccine Adverse Event Reporting System. That's really where anyone can enter a report, but uh, you have to go in and enter it um, and that's where we would expect to see more reports of severe outcomes. Um, and then there's a V-Safe system that uh, is on a cell phone that you can sign up for as soon as you get vaccinated. And it, it pings you every day to ask you how you're feeling. So in both systems, the vast majority of reports of um, outcomes after vaccination 
uh, were mild. Um, what we saw in terms of uh, severe outcomes is that there have been reports of anaphylaxis, 4.5 per million doses, which is in line with other vaccines, uh, such as the zoster vaccine, the influenza vaccine, et cetera. Um, but we do also know from these, uh, from these systems that we see a lot of um, reactogenicity, which is where we get uh, pain and also uh, flu-like symptoms from the vaccine. So this is from the V-safe system, which is actively following up with people after their vaccination. Uh, the, the majority of people had pain at their injection site, both for the Pfizer and the Moderna vaccines. You can see um, 70 to 78% of people. Lots of people had experienced fatigue, lots of headaches, muscle pains, chills, fever, um, a little bit of swelling. Um, so uh, on the whole, uh, the, the side effects reported are mild. Um, and so this is very promising information that we've been able to put out um, just today. And the link is down here at the bottom. Um, next slide. Uh, so our vaccine resources, I just want to draw your attention to, we have um, implementation guidance. That's the first link. There's overall vaccine data. And then the last link on here is our FAQs and we just updated them, so please go ahead and take a look um, on our FAQs. We have uh, new information about documentation needed for vaccination, um, you know, whether or not you can co-administer COVID-19 vaccine with hepatitis A vaccine, um, uh, and other uh, smaller updates just uh, because we've learned things in the past couple months. And next slide, and that's it for me. Happy to answer any questions. Thank you so much, Emily. Uh, and again, if you have any questions, please feel free to type in the chat box and we will uh, do our best to answer them. So moving along, I wanna, I'm very excited to introduce uh, Dr. Deborah Furholden from Michigan State University. Uh, she's gonna give us a presentation with, uh, about racial inequities in COVID in the state of Michigan. So I'm just gonna turn things right over to you, Dr. Furholden. Okay, great, next slide. I'm gonna go quick, but you guys are gonna get the slides afterwards. So I wanna talk a bit about some lessons learned. Next slide. Um, we learned very early on in the uh, pandemic that we had big racial disparities. Next slide. Can you all hear me? Uh -uh. Yep, you sound good. You... Oh, okay, great. Okay, next slide. It still says lessons learned on my end. Oh, they're having a problem with the network. All right, well, I'll keep talking because I'm going to just be so engaging. And then the slide sorter can catch up to this engaging talk. How about that? Okay, great. So uh, you all know, no big surprise. We had the first three states that came out and reported on the disparities were Illinois, Louisiana, and Michigan. Michigan has about 14% African-American population. I'm going to present some data later. It's going to say 15%. It depends on who's counting and how they're rounding. But somewhere between 14 and 15% of African-American uh, population and 41% of um, our initial corona cases were African-American. Uh, this was early in the pandemic in April. Uh, all coronavirus deaths in St. Louis, Missouri have been African-Americans. That was a dozen deaths. It's just still kind of like a little bone curling, you know, because there's very few other demographics that we could put in there that wouldn't make our skin crawl. Um, and, and some of that stemmed from goodwill, but a uh, bad outcome. Next slide. And I think Massachusetts was a really great example of that, and I really appreciate them for being transparent. And they said, their lawmakers came out and said, wow, we created this point system, right? They were trying to play the dice and, and, and give people with the best chance of surviving the best chance of surviving. And, and so they had a point system, and you got a point if you had a pre-existing health condition, you got a point if you were over a certain age, you got a point if you were homeless, you got to, you know, point for all these different things. And what they realized is, is the way that they were prioritizing people was inevitably ranking people of color and many other people um, lower priority for some important services that we know people needed. Um, next slide. And I don't ding any of these places. You know, these are the, the examples that we can point to because, um, and this was back in May, and I can tell you it's gotten a little bit better, but not a whole, whole lot. Um, we've got a big problem, not with just with the racial disparities, but with what I call, and I'm sure you can relate to, health data disparities. 
And I say this statement all the time, a lack of data fuels the debate. And, and I think it's borderline criminal to take receipt of all of these resources and not do the basic work of collecting the basic data so we can say who's getting what and who's maybe being left out. But um, uh, to this day, about half of the states really only have about half or less of the data um, that we would need on COVID cases and deaths to even really fully understand the extent of the problem. Um, next slide. And then we kick the can down the road and the same thing is happening um, for different reasons, but the same thing is happening um, with the COVID vaccines. And this is an article that I contribute to in USA Today. I didn't know that they were gonna put that quote in. I might've used more fancy or public health language, but it is to me a massive barrier, the lack of racial data. And again, I think it's such an avoidable uh, problem. And I'll, and I'll tell you what I think some basic solutions are for that that we could all be a part of. Uh, next slide. I'm gonna go back to COVID cases and deaths. Initially, we asked the question why, and we got what I call all the usual suspects. We, they said, well, you know, we've got these big racial disparities because, you know, African-Americans have more pre-existing health conditions and they have uh, increased exposure and, and they have so high on medical mistrust, they won't show up if they get sick. And then they're just more prone to misinformation and misunderstanding, and this was used to categorize a lot of disparate groups and explain why. And then we talked a little bit about social determinants of health, but they were mostly, um, what we saw, I think the main media narrative was mostly around social determinants of health that were not actionable, you know, in, in, in pre-existing health conditions also are not actionable. Um, you know, people were saying, talking about things like, oh, people live in, you know, healthcare deserts and things like that. Well, those aren't the kind of things that we were able to rapidly fix during the pandemic. Next slide. And so I sort of said, well, let's, let's look at the explanation uh, versus the algorithm. And we accepted these usual suspects and ex explanations, and many of those expl uh, explanations weren't ac actionable, but they did, however, influence the algorithms for who got what. Things like screening, things like mobile testing, hospital admissions, and do not resuscitate orders. Um, and I published an article with a colleague African Americans have a historically low rate of endorsement for DNRs, and we saw DNR endorsement go way up during COVID. And lo and behold, we found out because the people weren't able to give that recommendation themselves, and their loved ones who would normally make that decision weren't allowed in the hospital. So some likely well-meaning person in the hospital was making that decision for them. Um, and I say that those algorithms were and are, I think, uh, still in part attributable to a lot of the excess morbidity and mortality that we saw literally killing people. Next slide. So what are some of the solutions? Well, I think we need to reorder the algorithm. And so, and this is the approach that we used a lot in Michigan. So if people are high on these social determinants of health, and if they have increased exposure, and I kept the numbers the same in the order that they were used, but I said, what if we said, if you're, you know, living in a place where you don't have good access to, to healthcare, you don't have transportation or, you are unemployed or underemployed or live in a remote community. What if we use those things to prioritize people in the system of care instead of um, using it to disparage people? So a couple of takeaways next slide that we got is we really uh, heightened our um, work to bring a health equity lens um, to the work. Uh, we stopped describing the problem and reacting to the problem and began proactively designing and implementing solutions. Um, and I'll tell you, many of us, I think, are in quick reaction mode, but are similarly reacting as we mount this uh, vaccine uh, dis distribution and administration effort. Uh, we started to map solutions onto the priorities uh, versus uh, using um, those usual suspects um, to create variation in care uh, that was based on risk. We started to focus on the factors that we could control and impact and stop blaming the disparate because lo and behold, what we found out in Michigan, and I'll tell you about that, is that it wasn't what we thought. It wasn't actually the usual suspects that were driving uh, the big disparities that we saw. And lo and behold, the things that were, we were actually able to control, which is how we were able to eliminate the racial disparities in COVID cases and deaths. Um, it's important to use data to inform actions and interventions. Um, we have a lot of really well-meaning people working really, really hard but this disparity in data, the 
so the cracks in the system, data infrastructure, they don't give us what we need to not just do the work, but also to say how well things are working. I do a lot of work in the dissemination and implementation science space, and a part of that is also the science of the implementation. We say if you're gonna fail, better to fail fast. And I think we spent a lot of resource and time on strategies that really didn't get the job done, but we didn't have the data to help tell us that. And then to strengthen our public health infrastructure and public-private partnerships. Um, we did really creative things like, and I'll show you a, a snapshot, uh, stood up a, a data dashboard. Why? Because I'm an academic and I'm an epidemiologist. And I have a whole shop full of analysts and other folks who were just sitting around chomping at the bit, put me in the game coach. And then at the same time, we had a health department that was over their eyeballs uh, in work. So these public-private partnerships, and I will tell you the biggest barrier that we had is it took two months to get a data user agreement in place um, and to get through all of the red tape so that we could actually help them. We said we have zero interest in publishing this. It's not about that. We want to be in the fight and do what we can to lessen your load and help you the way that, that we can. So next slide, how are we doing with um, COVID in Michigan? All right, next slide. So I got this data from um, uh, Dr. Sarah Lynn Callow. Um, the, the, the snapshot is everybody's daily lives were affected, but definitely um, in Michigan, and it wasn't just the pandemic, it was also our response to the pandemic. I heard really bad stories of, you know, we, we sort of created one, one fix, and if it wasn't thoughtful enough, it gave rise to new problems. We did things like, um, you know, rolled out all this testing, but then you had to have a primary care physician prescription in the beginning or some kind of script, and then we said, well, if you came into the pandemic without health insurance, that's a problem. So then we said, well, you don't have to do that. And then people said, well, I still have transportation issues or it's not close enough to my house. So then we made drive up testing sites, but you couldn't walk through the sites. And then we said, we're just gonna get them everywhere that we can. And then we had that few stories of like ICE agents posted up near testing sites. So then we couldn't get um, residents who didn't have all their proper paperwork to come out for testing. It was just like all of the sort of things that make our society so unjust and unfair, it was like, you know, they all got, you know, smoked up out of the hole. Um, and so we were working really, really hard um, on that mitigation response. And we all know racial and ethnic minorities have experienced a different high level of impact um, and high risk of exposure um, is what we found in Michigan were the big culprits. And I'll talk about that um, in a little bit. Um, and then that high risk of exposure mostly due to employment, then gave rise to a lot of residential inequities and disparities that we saw, because they would take the, the virus back home um, in their homes and in their communities. Um, we saw much higher rates of infection and severe outcomes. Um, and so again, crucial that the health equity lens be applied to our pandemic response and recovery efforts. Uh, you can actually skip two slides. I've already acknowledged our wonderful um, director of the Bureau of Epi and Population Health, Dr. Sarah Lynn Callow. So here's a, a, a snapshot, and I, I want to give people the sort of uh, preface. And it seems obvious to me, but just in case it isn't for others, if you look at the total numbers in Michigan, you will miss the story because the disparities were so big in the beginning, it still will dilute our overall estimates. But if you look over time and you start to break it down into two-week moving averages and you look month by month, and I'll show you a graphic of what that looked like in Flint, the story really starts to unfold. So early in the pandemic, um, and these are our estimates up through um, March, and these were reported in, I'm sorry, these are the estimates reported through um, April. If you look, African Americans, again, make up about 15% of the population, 31.2% of COVID cases. Our Hispanic Latinx community is 5.3% of the population, and they were 10.7% of cases. So a two-fold overrepresentation in cases. Uh, next slide. If you look at um, then the progress that we made, fast forward to September, and we I, I stopped it at September because um, that's where we had about three periods of two-week moving averages of successive decline, 
And I can tell you that these numbers have been sustained, and I'm going to show you what it looks like in the city of Flint. Um, by September, African Americans, again, still 15% of the population, now 9.1% of cases. With solutions that match the level of the problem, African Americans are actually now underrepresented in COVID cases, and I'll show you what it looks like for COVID deaths. Similarly, we are underrepresented in COVID deaths. If you look for our Hispanic and Latinx population, um, we made a little bit of progress, but not very much. So um, Hispanic and Latinos are still overrepresented um, in COVID cases. Those numbers continue to inch down. And again, it points back to why the health equity lens and a really thoughtful approach is so important because some of the issues are different, right? We have a, a less than trivial proportion of the population who are not don't have all the documentation and paperwork. So creating trusted, safe places for them to access the resources that many others were able to access that allowed them to shelter in place, as an example. I always tell people shelter in place is tone deaf if you weren't able to do like I did and just, you know, pack up your desktop computer and a couple of monitors and switch your whole life over to Zoom. A lot of people didn't have that luxury. People had to work to keep the lights on. And even in the state of Michigan, we had a stay of eviction orders but that didn't mean that the money would not eventually come due. It just meant that you couldn't be put out at that time. And when that state of eviction order was lifted, a lot of people um, became homeless. And that's now a new problem um, that we're dealing with. So we made some progress there and we continue to make progress, but we didn't quite solve um, the problem. And I will tell you, there is now a Protect Michigan com uh, Commission that has a work group that is specifically focused on uh, dealing with issues around uh, uh, equitable and fair vaccine distribution and administration in that population, um, as well as COVID mitigation uh, strategies. Next slide. Um, we can actually skip this one because I have other stuff that I want to um, highlight. So real quick snapshot of what the deaths look like. Next slide. Again, African Americans, 15% of the population. We were 41.1% of the deaths. Um, early in the pandemic and by September, again, we're now underrepresented, representing only 12% of the deaths. In the Hispanic Latinx community, uh, earlier in the pandemic, they had a much lower death rate. And you can see that that went up, but they still, and that number is now hovering around 4%. Um, so it went in the wrong direction, but it didn't move sort of into that disparity world where they're overrepresented in deaths relative to their uh, representation in the population. So again, I think it just um, calls out the need um, for really thoughtful um, approaches as it relates to the specific needs of the communities that we're trying to serve. Um, you can skip two slides. I'm just gonna get to the bottom line on this. Um, the racial disparities that we saw in COVID deaths early in the pandemic were largely attributable to racial disparities in the COVID case rate, right? And that's a, sort of a no brainer. Um, but people weren't saying that. They were attributing the excess deaths to pre-existing health conditions and other things like that. So what we figured out is we just got to stop people from becoming cases. And what we saw is that that higher case rate were largely attributable to increased occupational and community exposure. And we really figured out uh, African Americans were just much more represented in these kind of high demand, low wage jobs where you can't do them at home, they weren't being provided the appropriate protection. We saw big disparities in who got enhanced unemployment. African-American small businesses were overlooked a lot in, in women-owned businesses and other minority-owned businesses and payroll protection programs. So people had to sort of make a living, if you will. And I think it was that, that we, from our estimates, it looks like that accounts for about 70% um, of the disparities that we saw. And then there was some variation in um, lower levels of healthcare utilization um, and preventive screening and testing and things. And we think that some of that is linked to systemic bias because people were hearing stories from their friends and neighbors about how they were turned away from the hospital or treated poorly. One of the things that our governor did subsequently do is she issued an executive order requiring implicit bias training and feedback for all frontline healthcare workers. That is yet to be implemented, but we are navigating through the process to figure out what that looks like when it stood up. But even just the declaration of it provided a lot in this community. Um, the racial disparities at the state level are narrowing and for African-Americans they have closed. And I think it's important to evaluate the impact of our efforts 
so that we know what worked and is working and what doesn't work or is not working the way we'd like it to, and we can devote our time and resources in places that are going to make the most difference. Um, and the local uh, county analyses should be mandated. I've been looking at data all across the state, and there's just so much disparity in the data that exists and the data that doesn't exist, and it still, to me, makes very little sense. Next slide, please. So this is a snapshot of Flint, and I am an academic, so can't help myself. Um, I did spare you a bunch of p-values and other things. I tried to stick with things that would be compelling, uh, but that is my natural inkling to p-values and things like that. These are relative risk estimates, and this is African-American compared to white. Flint is a very black, white city. Uh, less than 3% of the population is non-black or non-white or some combination of the two. Um, and so you can see early on in the pandemic, and the blue line is for deaths in the county. The um, orange line is for deaths in the city of Flint. So Flint is interesting. It's in the middle of Genesee County. It's what's called the county seat. It's where most of our county offices and all those things are located. And the county overall is much whiter and wealthier, and Flint is uh, much blacker. It's about 60% African American in the city of Flint compared to uh, less than 30% of the whole county. Um, so Flint doesn't really fit the average uh, of the county. So early in the pandemic, and this goes month by month, you can see whether we're looking at the city or the county, there was about a seven to eight fold increase risk of COVID death. Um, I'm sorry, an eight to nine fold increase risk of COVID death for African Americans compared to whites in both the county and in the city of Flint. And there was about a five fold increase in the likelihood of becoming a case uh, for African Americans. The thing that was really sad there was if you were African-American, you were much more likely to experience death than if you were white. And if you were African-American, you were much more likely to become a case. So we really focused our effort on how do we keep them from becoming cases in the first place. Um, and I will say we had a large rollout of resources from our philanthropic community who came in and backfilled all the gaps. We had many, many programs for minority-owned businesses, women-owned businesses. We did direct cash assistance rent payments, things like that, so that people could actually honor um, the shelter-in-place order. And I think that was probably where we really saw the tide start to turn. Those resources started to roll out in June, and by July, you can see all of our stuff starts to dip down really, really low. That bump that you see that happens there in September, I think was attributed to school reopening and the college students coming back. We got that under control within a month, and African Americans to date remain at the same or lower risk for COVID cases and deaths um, in um, the city of Flint. And the data dashboard that we have has been key. Before we had the data dashboard, the way we get our COVID testing data, which is how we identify cases, is it comes in a huge big batch file once a week. And they're constantly filling in holes in that data. So all our health department was able to do was to update total numbers they just didn't have the capacity to make sense of those numbers to produce trend reports and things like that. So our data, uh, data dashboard, and I encourage you all to check it out, is really great and it's a tool that residents can use, communities can use, our philanthropic sector has used it, et cetera. And you can get uh, data broken down by race, by gender, by geography, by health insurance status, by all the things that we know matter um, that if you wanted to target um, intervention. Next slide. I'm going to roll through these real quick because it's less about the information and more about a resource that I want to share. Oh, and if anybody's interested, uh, you can check it out at uh, GCHD, Genesee County Health Department, gchd.us forward slash coronavirus. Um, I, right before this, uh, from 12 to 1, I finished our 49th week of our Flint Community COVID webinar, you could have never told me 49 weeks ago that we'd still be at this 49 weeks later, um, but we give a regular update. This is just my little slide, a slither of that, um, um, of that forum. We get about two to 300 inside of the webinar each week. We get another couple hundred that are viewing it live stream on different partner websites, Facebook and YouTube, and then we get about another eight to 1200 who view in the week that follow. And it's really cool because I've been told by a lot of folks that um, for their older parents, they go over on Saturdays and they watch it like they watch a TV program 
uh, with their parents on Saturdays. And so we give all the latest and greatest information. We let people know what new testing sites are available, new vaccine sites, things like that. We give them data. This is a snapshot of something that we created called the COVID-19 Health Equity Brief. We push that out through my Flint Center for Health Equity Solutions, which is an NIH-funded center, and people absolutely love it. And if you would just click through the slides and just stay on it for just a sec, this is the kind of stuff we share with people. No, even though we do pretty good with unknown data, we still have that problem. And what happens is each successive week, some of that data gets backfilled and we're going back and constantly updating. Because the question I ask myself is if all the unknowns were African-American, have we eliminated the racial disparities? So we do go back and backfill that data so we can say with certainty that that's the case. Next slide. Um, a new effort that we also have, our wonderful new health officers started to integrate the social vulnerability index. They made a massive mistake in the state and they prioritize vaccine distribution for counties that have the highest proportion of people in the 65 and over category. And the problem that I have with that is in Michigan, counties with high proportions of 65 and older tend to be whiter and wealthier. Because what do people do? They retire, they grab their money, they leave their house in the city or wherever, and they go buy some great place up north. I've tried to explain to folks that living past 65 is a privilege. And so if you prioritize just based on that, you've built privilege. Again, well-meaning people. My governor, our um, uh, 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 top doc, Dr. Jonay Caldoun, these are like the real McCoys, well-meaning, you know, but if you rank, if you rank the, the, the counties that way, Flint and Genesee County would be number 81 of 83. If you rank us by our death rate, we're number seven of 83. If you rank us by our uh, COVID death rate, we're somewhere between number three and five. So again, that equity lens is so important. <clears throat> Next slide. Similar measure called the distress index. I'll spare you, it's very similar to SDI. It uses four variables, mostly focused on economic deprivation. We're also integrating that to make sure that the people who need it the most are getting it. Next slide. I wanna be invited back. We make recommendations to policymakers every week uh, through our um, equity brief that goes out. It's great, we shout them out. Um, we did a plug for the uh, governor's um, new equity plan that just got rolled out. It's how you get street cred with people. You talk about the things that matter to them and then they become partners because we all know that data doesn't drive policy politicians do. So we try to use the data to influence the politicians. Next slide. Um, we've got a big push for volunteerism. Everybody wants to get in the game. We set up a good volunteer system and now those people are being um, activated. We also have a My COVID Alert app. And one of the things we did with reopening is if you go in a restaurant, you're automatically input in that. So you get automatically notified if you have come in contact with a case or you become a case to people who were around you get notified. Next two slides, that's all I got is two slides. I'm gonna take 30 more seconds. So the equity needs in the critical conversations. I think we need equity and vaccine access for high risk and vulnerable populations. Uh, we need equity and distribution, and that needs to be national and global. I don't think we have it. I think we have well-meaning people who've done things like put it in communities where they have the most, you know, greatest proportion of older people, not realizing that that also has inequity built into it, if that's the only metric you're using. And we need equity and other COVID-related resources. There's that great Swiss cheese model, the multiple layers improve success. And I'll tell you, it falls on deaf ears to a lot of African Americans that our health is so important now when we were left out of other critical things. And I've been asking the question like, which companies got the money uh, to distribute, to, to transport all this vaccine to community? What companies were used for purchasing to purchase all these freezers that had to be purchased? Were women owned businesses and minority owned businesses prioritized in that since we were left out of disproportionately payroll protection and some of these other things? The answer is no, because there's no more mandate or affirmative action um, in government purchasing. So those are the kind of things we could do. Last slide, I ask you to all be my partners in a movement to mandate equity, hashtag, put it on your social media, please, please, please. I say our natural drift is to inequity, a federal mandate would push states to figure it out. I think it would also inspire communities of practice because some agencies and some communities are doing better than others. And guess what? In the same way, if I broke curfew, I got punished. If states uh, broke equity and they got less vaccine, they would figure it out and they'd find out from the 
other states who are doing it better, what they're doing. Um, and similarly, counties, I think, will work the same way. I say if it matters, it should be law. If there is will, there is a legislative way. And we need real equity experts to avoid well-meaning perpetuation of inequity. Next slide is my contact information. There's a bunch of bonus sides. I don't have any time for that, but I try to dispel myths on vaccine hesitancy. Feel free to take them and digest them on your own later. Thanks. Thank you so much, Dr. Perholden. There's a, just a ton of great uh, content there. I wanted to ask a, a follow-up question. Uh, there's so much great analysis that's going on here, like in such sort of subtle analysis of data, like to understand how equities are sort of perpetuating through data yeah. and into decision-making. So I sure. know a lot of communities want to be able to do that. Do you have like, suggestions for like, where do you find the expertise or the skill set or the tools to really dive into that kind of level of analysis and, and be able to sort of like identify these insights about how, how inequities are perpetuating? Yeah, what I'd really love to see uh, is the CDC uh, take the reins here as a national leader in this. And I'd really like for us to make and create communities of practice. Because not, not every community in Michigan is the same. So what worked well in Flint and Genesee County might not work as well in a more rural part of the, um, the country. But there are best practices around equity, and there is real foundational work. To me, a lot of what I call the equity lens is really a way of viewing the world and viewing problems and viewing solutions. And I do realize a lot of people are well-meaning, but they just don't have it. So they do things that make sense but it doesn't fit the framework for equity, right? And so I feel like now everybody talks about social determinants of health and health equity and things like that without really being steeped in it. You know, it would be like me, you know, sort of walking in the hospital and throwing on scrubs and saying who needs some, you know, medical care, right? I wouldn't pretend to do that, but here I've been doing this for 20 plus years, you know, and, and you know, so I come to things like this because I try to share that. So I think we need communities of practice. And I think the CDC and, and, and the people that hold the purse strings could be the leaders, not in the conversation, but in the getting the conversation to people who need it. Thank you so much. And we had a question earlier about, uh, about sort of generating the political will to sort of go down this road and really explore inequities and, and to actually do something about them. Can you talk about, you, you talked uh, a lot about uh, how data was really important to that. Were there other elements that sort of helped you or and helped everyone else who has been working on this to sort of raise awareness and generate enough political will to really sort of unpack some of these things and, and work on fixing them? Yeah, I'll tell you the role of community in this, I cannot underscore enough. The problem is there's not a lot of built-in mechanism for widespread community input. I did not realize when we started our webinar that it would be that. Uh, we've had about 12% of the entire city have participated in that webinar in some form or fashion. Like I said, we'll get easily six to 800 views of that uh, webinar within the two or three days that follow. Um, and so you need good feedback loops for community to be able to elevate their voice and tell you what they're actually dealing with. Again, I think being well-meaning, we oftentimes will do things for community or to community, but not with community. You know, so there's something to be said for you know, real equity, right? So diversity, having a lot of different voices and letting people in the room. Equity is giving those people a seat at the table. And inclusion is valuing the voice and the role that they play at that table, literally letting them have a say in what's happening. So if we talk about DEI, we have to actually then do DEI. And I think the big mark we miss is we don't include the community that we're out to serve in the process enough. Again, thank you so much. I know we uh, if, uh, we have some people in the chat window who are eager to ask questions. If you have a question, uh, please feel free to go ahead and type it in the chat. Also, uh, we'd love to hear your experiences with uh, with equity during the 
uh, during COVID and uh, things you've tried that have been successful or not successful, please feel free to uh, jump in and, and type those in the chat window. Uh, so we're going to move on to our next presentation. I'm very excited to introduce uh, some guests of ours from uh, Worcester, Massachusetts. Uh, so I want to introduce Leah Bradley, uh, who's from the Central Massachusetts Housing Alliance, uh, Dr. Maddie Castile from the Worcester uh, Health and Human Services, uh, Jack Moran from Central Mass uh, Housing Alliance, and James Brooks from the City of Worcester. Uh, and they're, as you can see, uh, going to talk about uh, using an equity lens in vaccination of people experiencing homelessness. So with that, I'm going to turn things over to Leah. Leah, the floor is all yours. Thank you so much, and we really appreciate the opportunity to talk about the partnership that's been created through COVID with the City of Worcester, the continuum of care, and, and really all of the homeless providers in, in the City of Worcester. You know, all of this couldn't have happened without that partnership. And before I pass it along to Dr. Castile for the, um, to talk about pre-COVID and what happened during COVID as kind of a background, and then also the mobile vaccination clinics, I want to share with you all that this was not something that was very, that we planned for months ahead of time. You know, we are fortunate that in Massachusetts, persons experiencing homelessness or that are living in shelters were prioritized in phase one of the vaccination plan, which I know is, is not happening across the entire nation. And what that did is it, it forced us to really push this forward much more quickly, which in some ways is, uh, is a benefit because we just had to do it. And, and you know, I, I just remember, you know, Jack was coming into the hallway in, in our office and saying, hey, they said that we, should, we might want to consider using HMIS. And I said, well, that's a great idea. Let's reach out to Dr. Castile, you know, and figuring that out and, and doing it in a way that was just that wasn't as planful as you would like, but it did. It happened. We made it work, and we're really seeing some great benefits from it. And so just encourage you all that even though we had to do it quickly, we now have that experience. We have some lessons learned, and you can reach out to us as well if you are thinking about doing this, if there's any concerns that you have about mobile vaccination clinics or at the shelters, but also the use of HMIS and how we're using that to, to help log the vaccinations so that we can, um, we can support folks to get their second vaccine as well. And with that, I will pass it over to uh, Dr. Castile. And I want to just start by saying that uh, what we've learned, it didn't go to the next slide yet. Um, there we go. Well, what we learned through this process and what most people say is that um, COVID brought out the inequities um, that exist in healthcare. And most of us know that uh, those inequities have existed for quite some time. Um, but um, actually more people paid attention during this time. And so um, looking forward and have worked to make, to create some changes. And um, when we were looking at um, pre-COVID wise, what um, our sheltering uh, system was in Worcester, the city of Worcester really um, has made um, homelessness an important piece of what they do. And, and looking into housing first and, and rapid rehousing models. So we started the Housing First Coordinating Council where all the agencies meet together um, to discuss where we are, to discuss the data, and to discuss what needs to change. Um, you know, we, we uh, a part of the, of the uh, Coordinating Council is to have the outreach providers to deploy staff to locations most frequently, uh, most frequented by the homeless community. That's also a priority for the City of Worcester um, where we actually have um, hired outreach workers, homeless outreach workers, homeless strategists, um, and recovery coaches to go out into the community um, and, and uh, help, the, help people get them into treatment if possible, if it's addiction or mental health issues, um, to stabilize people. Um, and then looking at shelters to follow best practices of low barrier access, safe environment, and appropriate diversion, looking at our shelters overall, um, which, which are overcrowded and looking at how do we, how do we, um, and our goal is certainly never to, uh, to increase sheltering, but uh, we live in Worcester and probably a lot of areas around, uh, around the country are experiencing the same issues with housing. And so therefore, um, tough to house people if, if we can't find um, apartments for, for um, a livable cost. Um, so then we looked at also where uh, housing first retention fund and how do we how do we prevent homelessness uh, before people get into shelters and um, so that strengthens homeless prevention through uh, CMHA and RCAP are some of the 
uh, ways that we have been working through that. Um, and, and certainly looking at, because we've had a housing problem, uh, looking at developing new housing. Um, so far we've developed, we, we are in the process of developing a 25, uh, actually in total 50 units um, and, and looking to do a total of 103 oh. units overall. Um, next slide. So when we started, when, when, um, when COVID came around and, and looking at our shelters, our, our one shelter, which is a small shelter, had 160 uh, plus clients. And one of the things that we did initially, this is still pre-COVID, is that we started an overflow shelter for, for freezing nights. Um, and, and then we, we, we looked at what was happening in the shelters and, and truly there was a lack of, 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 uh, of services. We didn't have primary care services. So um, nobody went to the shelters really to bring that kind of care substance use treatment, psychiatric services, financial services, um, all of this we were looking at. We actually brought those services when, we, when COVID came. Um, so next slide. And then when, uh, when we started in March, uh, we decided to, to decongregate, uh, and this is done through the city of Worcester in collaboration with the shelter, but we, we uh, decongregated the, the shelters uh, well, with ESG funds. And we divided into uh, three non-COVID shelters. We used uh, the schools, some of the churches um, to divide to um, have these shelters. And we had one uh, COVID positive uh, shelter that was um, at, at our technical high school. Um, we had, uh, so during this time, we started to bring a medical care, um, addiction care, uh, mental health care um into the shelters um and it was amazing to see what happened during that time um that that people were actually uh responding we put we put uh people on suboxone treatment for their addiction we brought mental health uh, providers whether it was through telehealth which we we weren't even using telehealth to the degree that we started using telehealth um at um during these times um that's one of the pieces also that that COVID brought out is the ability to use telehealth um, and um, ev ev I mean, workforce development, everything was brought into the shelters. We also um, started in March through April, started a test, and that was also done um, with the city of Worcester and conjunction with the hospital. We brought mobile testing to the shelters. Um, we had uh, 430 total COVID tests that were administered. Um, and again, we went to the sites and did the, um, the testing. Um, so a total of 245 um, homeless uh, population were tested, and out of that uh, population, 95 um, uh, individuals tested positive. So that was 39% of the homeless population uh, tested positive. And the interesting thing about that was that the majority of them were asymptomatic. Um, it, but the good thing about um, about doing these tests is that people are walking through the streets, um, and so even if they're asymptomatic, they're, 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 um, um, people are able to, uh, they're able to spread uh, COVID in that way. And so testing, we were able to isolate people, quarantine people. And what we have in Massachusetts are the state hotels um, exactly for this reason. If, they're, if you're unable to quarantine, you're able to go to one of the state hotels and they will, uh, you can stay there during the entire quarantine. So we isolated people and quarantined people. Um, then we brought um, supported services to the shelters that, that I mentioned, uh, whether it was health insurance who didn't have um, health insurance, and, um, and that's a small minority of people in Massachusetts, but we were able to enroll who didn't have health insurance. Um, we were able to provide primary care in these settings. Again, um, as, uh, medication for, for addiction, uh, with Suboxone care, we were able to uh, meet with the, um, with the um, methadone providers who actually daily brought methadone who, for, who wanted methadone versus Suboxone, um, worked with workforce development to try to get people uh, uh, jobs or training, and then we ended up uh, doing rapid rehousing of, of these people um, in the sense that they were, they were stabilized. We were able to get them into addiction care or if they went into detox and then detox to a residential we were able to get at least um, 40 of the people of the shelter clients connected with stable housing after that. Um, and then for us, that's the model of care uh, that we, we think is important for the homeless population. Um, certainly um, um, splitting the shelters and having less people in a shelter 
Um, and then again, we opened up another shelter for women, in particular women who are who are trafficked, uh, to really think about um, you know providing um, that that trauma care for um, for for women, and overall that should be the care for all, um, and that's the care that should be happening in shelters that we, we should be able to to afford, along with um, medical care for for all. Next. So for, for, for us, for the city of Worcester, um, we, we really um, think that the model of care for sheltering should be different. And we look at something in, in the sense of looking at hotels, um, something that, that people can actually be in a room, um, have their own bathrooms, have their own um, ability to, um, uh, to also, in, in a sense, socially distance, but having their own room and, and giving people, um, you know, sort of that that dignity and humanity that, that they uh, need to have. And, and from there, um, really to bring in on-site client health care and services. And we found that by being able to do that, we were also able to stabilize their medications. Uh, we brought nurses in from, from the schools that weren't, that weren't um, uh, in the schools at the time and, and actually stabilized overall with medication and with primary care. Uh, we brought um, supportive services. And then that changes the stigma around mental health and, and homelessness, and that was our goal. Um, and then to, overall, what it does is to decrease the cost in healthcare, and this is sort of the quality model that we think should be part of what we do, um, not only in Worcester, but it should be throughout the country. I think, um, you know, the, the sustainable results was that we increased housing retention, uh, we decreased in healthcare and city costs of, with ambulance, whether uh, police, emergency room visits, overall decrease in overdose deaths um, and uh, decrease in commercial sexual exploitation. Next slide. So uh, most recently what we've been doing, and, and as Leah said, um, the, uh, the state of Massachusetts uh, has rolled out their vaccine um, by looking at an equity model. So when they started the phases initially was in the hospitals where we uh, you know, not only the doctors and the nurses were vaccinated, but the people who bring the food into the um, hospitals, the people who clean the, not, not food into the hospital, food into the rooms uh, of a COVID positive patient or, or people who clean the rooms of COVID positive uh, patients. So it was throughout the hospital that everyone was, um, was vaccinated. Um, and then one of the priorities right after that were group homes um, and then shelters. And so um, this, and, and one of the, the ways that we brought uh, vaccinations into the health and to the shelters was was doing it mobile, um, and so through the uh, through the city of Worcester with our um, Department of Public Health is how we uh, mobilely uh, brought vaccines. Um, and this was um, and, and and let me just say that the reason that that, that this was done is because, again looking at the high transmission rate of of, uh, of people that uh, were homeless, um, the percentage of that were positive in the beginning. Um, and, and of course, you know, the idea that they can't isolate and, again, a vulnerable population, this is why Massachusetts prioritized um, vaccines to the shelter. And so this was done in partnership, again, with the, with the cities, the Department of Public Health, um, which is under Health and Human Services. Um, and we also um, provided education uh, throughout our, our community and through the shelters. Um, to be able to have people understand about the vaccine, the importance of that, the vaccine, and the hesitancy that people would have regarding that. Um, one of the things that was um, really interesting for us is that having the medical students, they were trained. We have about 450 vaccinators that were trained uh, through the medical school to be able to help us with vaccinations, whether it's a mass vaccination site or coming um, in a mobile unit with myself uh, to go out into the community and vaccinate. Um, so, um, so next slide. Next slide. So the, the, the benefits of mobile uh, clinics overall is to provide equitable access, to reduce the barriers and, uh, like transportation, childcare, work schedule, and anybody who you think about people suffering with mental health issues, with substance use, the last thing that anybody has in their mind, um, or whether they're essential workers, that anybody in those senses is actually, oh, I need the vaccine. People need to figure out, um, um, you know, um, whether it's substance use or psychiatric issues, that, that that is probably one of the least priorities in them. Um, so if we brought the vaccines to them, then we're more likely to be able to accept the vaccine. 
Um, and so that's, that's part of our, our, our thought process is bring the vaccine to the clients and meeting them where they are. Next slide. So our, um, again, our vaccinations is our on-site vaccinations. They uplift equity. In Worcester, the Latinx and black populations are twice as likely to test positive for COVID. So just like in the, in the prior um, uh, discussion, um, this is, of course, throughout, the, throughout nationally that these are the issues and sort of looking at how do we bring equity to our community, and that's by going to the sites um, where, where people are uh, to, uh, to be able to not only uh, give the vaccinations but also uh, be able to talk to them about the vaccine and having town halls with people in the communities and different groups in the community so that they understand um, about the vaccine. And what it does is it eliminates barriers in vaccinations. It engages populations um, who have historical um, and existing health disparities. Um, it was a real-time educational opportunity uh, for, uh, for the ambassadors, um, uh, the trusted members of the community, for the shelter staff. Um, and again, that's, that's part of uh, what we did in the community. It's also, for me, was a, a plus to have medical students. There's a way to looking at how we've changed um, the stigma, um, access to health care in our community, if we start training our, our medical students to, to work and to understand about shelters, about people who are homeless, um, and overall um, communities of color so that they understand um, what they need to do as they move forward in their community. And lastly, to address stigma, uh, changes of perspective, to, to change the perspective on homeless. You know, people walk right to advise people who are homeless. They don't acknowledge what's going on. And so ultimately to understand what brought them to homelessness and to understand that bringing appropriate health care, appropriate addiction and mental health care and all the needs that they need, that, that these are people who are going to be resilient and, and be able to um, continue a, a life of, as everyone else. So, and also to build new partnerships. And that's one of the pieces that we learned um, throughout our um, this whole COVID piece that we worked in silos. And now how do we all work together? We brought healthcare, we brought all these things. How do we continue this um, throughout, um, not only through COVID, but throughout the rest of the time? So next slide. So now I'm gonna introduce uh, Leah Bradley, who's the Executive Director of Central Mass uh, Housing Alliance. Great. Thank you, Dr. Castile. And, and I just want to go back to what she had indicated about some of the things that, you know, we witnessed and we saw happen at the shelters um, while we were there is that we are the ambassadors as the staff as well. They trust us. So they see us getting vaccines. They see, um, you know, a lot of our staff are also people of color. And so it, it instills some trust with them as well. And it, it, it really was one of the um, things that we really highlighted, highlighted with them as well as the education. And so having the medical students there, having Dr. Castile there to really, for folks that had questions and had those questions answered right there on the spot and didn't, didn't continue to walk around with what those questions were. So I think that's the real value of what bringing the, the, the vaccines to the shelters brought. The other thing, one of our shelters is um, right next door to our Health Care for the Homeless and um, our Community Health Center. And us bringing the vaccines actually to the place where they're most comfortable was more effective than asking them to even just walk across the street and go to a place where they're not quite there. They're definitely comfortable there, but bringing it to where they live and where they sleep was a much more effective model. So this slide is really just, a, I'm not going to go through each um, bullet point, was really just to show that the, uh, the partnership of the COC funding and the lead agency and also the ESG funding is really what brought all of this together and allowed this to happen to really create a coordinated system and there's not the outside of the city of Worcester. There's also some state funds that were used around some FEMA funds, some um, COVID funds to do some sheltering, some overflow sheltering outside of the city as well. Next slide. Um, so, really, for this slide, what, what we found is that while we were talking through this, is in, and I think um, in, uh, the previous presenter had also talked to, talked about this as well. That the departments of public health are really, really busy. Right now, they're trying to get all of this going and everything out. And what we had learned through this is that as the convener for the continuum of care, us being the single point of contact, not only for our subrecipients, but also for the, for the State Department of Public Health, really helped facilitate some of these conversations and get this going more quickly. If we can provide a solution, then they're much more likely to reach out to us and help us to uh, implement that solution. 
And you know, I, and the other, um, the one of the things we also wanted to make sure with folks is that while, while we were talking about using HMIS, is, is promoting the value of entering the data. And so, what really, um, what is that going to do for those uh, individual programs? And really, it's so that they can help to track their clients, um, and I should say log. We, 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 when we say track, when we talk about vaccines, it gets confused with actually tracking the vaccination. Well, what, what we're actually doing is logging it so that the staff can help. They can say, hey, you're, you're, you're due in such and such a date, or you know, we have this list for you. Um, we have this list that we can re reference, and we know when your appointment is and where it's going to be, so that they have the, some tools to help our clients because we know how transient they are. Um, next slide. I probably moved into that one as well. Um, so the other um, part about it is that the the second dose, as you all know, uh, complicates the transient populations for sure. So those the individuals who go to multiple shelters don't stay at the same shelter. Uh, we really wanted to provide some tools for folks to be able to to move through that and and um, even the if they were at a shelter that's operated by the same agency but not the same location, they could still take a look and see when, when those vaccines are, are um, due for those folks. Uh, we also had talked a little bit about the future use of this could possibly be as uh, folks are getting vaccinated more is to be able to think who is vaccinated, who isn't vaccinated, so that folks can get cohorted a little bit differently. Um, that's definitely in the future. And you know we do keep on saying to folks that no matter um, no matter what we're talking about, vaccination is not a condition of sheltering. And so even though we have the HMIS assessment and we're, we are looking at this and logging it, it's really important that folks understand that they, folks cannot be refused shelter because they're not vaccinated and, and really emphasizing that in all of the things that, that we've, um, we've, um, we've documented with this. Next slide. I'm going to go through this quickly because uh, Jack is actually going to show you uh, the, what the actual assessment looks like. So there's really just that we wanted to make it as simple as possible. We wanted it to be a drop-down field and then some notes, and, and that's really about it, so that it was really easy. We all know everybody is really busy right now, and having this extra task was one of the things that, as the COC lead, we needed to promote. We also needed to, needed to make it really easy for folks to enter so that there wasn't, um, there wasn't as much um, complication to getting it in. The uh, benefit of having the mobile clinic is that the shelter staff could sit right with the folks who are vaccinating and enter the data right in real time. So it gave us a better uh, picture and it also get, made, made it easier for folks to be able to enter that data. Next slide. So for the monitoring function, so this is where the City of Worcester also helped us to um, purchase some, some data um, analysis tools so that we can use this data uh, in, in a much broader sense than just looking at the individual assessment. So we are able to present to uh, pull weekly reports, and Jack's going to show you an example example of that, so that the staff gets that on a weekly basis. They can see who the client is, and um, who needs their second dose, and where they need to get it. So that's going to be a really helpful tool for those folks. We also know that it's going to provide us with some aggregate data. So we'll be able to look at. You'll see some of the results that we've seen to date, and I'll share with you that um, this week was the week of our second dose clinic. So some of the data is still hot off the press and we don't have it all, all compiled. Um, and you know, we wanted to be able to look at the demographic data just around the, uh, their, the race, ethnicity, age, um, which shelter they're at, to be able to make some decisions around do we need to target some additional outreach, do we need to do some additional town halls, what are some of the things that we need to do to vaccinate as many folks as possible. Um, it also provides us the opportunity to, to identify any gaps, like I had said before with some of it, like which shelters are and aren't getting vaccinated and do we need to reach out to them individually as a convener to, um, to be able to, to say, how do we help create a partnership with you? How do we help do those things? Um, we also wanted to know, you know who's refusing. So it'll give us a list of um, who's re who, which shelters may have people who are refusing and, and is there an opportunity for education there? Um, so next slide. So our results to date, um, on my screen, the bottom section is a, is a little bit cut off. Um, so of, the, of those that were uh, enrolled in the individual shelters, so those folks at NHMIS we have an enrollment on, 86 of those were enrolled during, that, um, vac during those vaccination clinics for 61%. Um, that's a pretty phenomenal rate for the number of, of homeless 
for people experiencing homelessness who actually got vaccinated. Um, in the family shelter system, uh, we also found that of the staff and clients that were um, that were vaccinated, because as, as we were saying, the, the staff are ambassadors to our clients, 47% were Latinx, 20% 20, 20 Black, and 33% White. And, you know, when we looked at that, you know, we, we were just really um, excited about the fact that we found a way that we can get folks, people of color, to be vaccinated, and that's by bringing the vaccinations to where they're at. Uh, next slide. For the individuals, um, the for those who were vaccinated during the clinics, now we, um, so for the family shelters, we operate that, um, that, that family shelter system, so we had access to the data. This actually comes out of the HMIS. 10% um, were black or African American, compared to the 90, about 90% white. And then for um, Hispanic and Latino, 21% were um, Hispanic, Latino, and 78% were non-Hispanic, uh, non-Latino. So again, that's still a rate that's much, much higher than what we're seeing across the nation. So it really shows us that bringing the vaccines to folks is, is really the, the best way for us to, to get equity when we're talking about vaccinations. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Jack, next slide, who's going to give you, just show you um, what we act, you'll actually see in our assessments to sh just show you some of the fields that we have. Sure. So thank you, Leah. Um, so the, the philosophy or the approach that we took to this is, like Leah was saying, to keep it as simple as possible. Uh, the assumption here is that any client that a uh, case manager is interacting with is someone that has an existing uh, HMIS profile and HMIS enrollment in place already into the either shelter or uh, uh, congregate um, program that they're part of. Um, and given that, we, in aiming to keep the, the data entry burden as low as possible, as friction-free as possible, uh, we boiled this down to uh, a single question, which would essentially be, uh, asking the client, you know, what is your current vaccination status? And we realized that the answer to that question, if you can go to the next slide, please. Uh, within the answers, that offers us the opportunity to capture the name of the manufacturer and whether or not the client is on a first dose or whether they've already had both doses or whether they are a person who has a medical exception or an allergy or if they're refusing to be vaccinated at this point. So any of those details we were able to elicit from just the one question. And then if you can go to the next slide, please. Um, on the assumption that the client has indicated that they are receiving or that they have received one dose of the two dose vaccination, say for example, the Moderna uh, is the example we're seeing here. Uh, the other detail that would be an object of interest to capture would be the date that that was administered, obviously. So that field is conditionally presented to case managers who uh, are then obviously just gonna fill in uh, the answer that the client's able to provide them to that question, or if they're there during one of the vaccination clinics, that's ideal and they can actually just record the current date. Um, and then along with that, if they have an appointment for an upcoming uh, additional dose, that field is also presented along with a notes field, which um, we're just making use of the notes field currently to record the location of any future appointment. Uh, clicking the save button on that is essentially all that's necessary for the uh, case manager to take care of. And if you can go to the next slide, um, that provides us with the opportunity to reference all of those data points and capture that information uh, for reporting back out to program managers and, and case managers as needed that informs them of any clients that have uh, appointments coming up this week, any clients that are already fully vaccinated, so there's no need to continue that dialogue with. Um, and it's, it's kind of nice to see there's a few examples I think we see in the list that uh, we just noticed have been uh, updated this week to uh, receive two doses of vaccination. So. Um, with that, I think we, um, uh, the, the first clinic we had on completing second doses, uh, I believe it was earlier this week, we were able to achieve a, uh, a second dose 
on schedule rate of 68% at that clinic. So that's uh, sort of the benchmark that we're working with. And, you know, I think we still have probably a lot of work to do, but we're feeling pretty good about that. And um, looking forward to be able to use this information for um, keeping folks on track and, you know, studying some of the other lenses of, of equity that we might be able to help um, make adjustments to in the future. Next slide, and I think, Dr. Castile, that's to you. So part of the considerations is, is partnering, uh, partnering with shelters to enter HMIS during the mobile clinic, uh, partner with the CHCs, with the community health centers, the hospitals, the local Department of Public Health to administer vaccine. Um, and to ensure uh, sufficient social distancing space, um, administering uh, one, one of the things we'd like to look at is, is um, administering the single dose. So when the J Johnson and Johnson comes out, uh, it will be a single dose. I think somebody was asking the question if they prioritize unsheltered uh, persons at the um, uh, through the state. No, they didn't prioritize it. And one of the things I think through this process that would be actually better would be to have the Johnson & Johnson vaccine and to be able to uh, to give the one shot and not have to do the, the second shot so that um, it's, it's a one and done, which would be excellent. Um, and to explore um, cross-program sharing of data. Um, and that's, that's, again, going back to um, not working in silos and being able to, um, uh, to, to share the data would be important. Um, and again, a plan for extra vaccines, um, and that's part of what we've had, and, and certainly having an on-call list for those that, that, that are eligible. Sometimes when we went to uh, some of the sites, uh, you know, we may have planned for a certain amount of vaccines, and some may have decided at that point that they didn't want the vaccine, so we had extra vaccines. Um, and then we have a, a list of people that are eligible during that phase that we call in to be able to, to then give the vaccines also. Um, and so the next steps, again, are, is planning for unsheltered individuals um, experiencing homelessness. Um, for us, it's waiting until phase three, um, and uh, which um, will be shortly. Um, and the idea is, again, to bring the Johnson & Johnson vaccine. There's also some data that may be indicating that, that some of the, the, the uh, Pfizer vaccine may, may have, um, even after uh, 14 days of the first shot may have uh, good results. Also, waiting to hear final um, ideas with that, but the one shot would be ideal. Um, again, targeted outreach um, based on data. So through our um, through our uh, COVID-19 equity task force, we we know where uh, there there is high positivity of of, of COVID um, and and certainly less resources. So it's it's areas that we look at. Um, and then use vaccination data for shelter management and, and cohorting. And again, to continue maintaining the partnerships, the collaborations um, that, that have been created. And again, what, does, what, what did COVID bring out for us? Um, uh, besides understanding that, that uh, inequities have existed and we need to really look at inequities and how do we change them, but also uh, the idea of silos does not work in our community and that how do we all continue to collaborate to, together uh, to continue to provide services on site, not only in shelters throughout our communities. If we're looking at equity, how does how do we do that in bringing bringing uh, whatever it is, whether it's vaccines, whether it's testing, or anything else? What we want to do with healthcare, it has to be brought to the sites where people are, um, and again, bringing the critical services to the shelter, and and lastly is looking at shelter design, and really need to look at something differently um, for for us, and again single or double room, so we were looking at something like a hotel where people have a, a bathroom um, or the use of SROs and thinking about limiting infections. I'm pretty sure this is not going to be the, the end uh, of, of infections that we're going to continue to have, hopefully no more pandemics. Um, but um, again, privacy for healthcare, um, both physical and behavioral. Um, so again, looking at a new uh, model of care for, for homelessness and, and, and really uh, to bring um, to bring dignity, respect, humanity to uh, people who are homeless, and um, and that's it. So thank you. 
Thank you so Thank you. much. Great presentation. And uh, if, if you have any questions, please uh, type them in the chat window uh, and our presenters from Worcester will be uh, around and able to answer your question. Thank you so much. Uh, so I'm going to, we're going to do a quick update on ESGB, uh, ESGCB uh, grant status. Uh, Sharon? All right. I will make this very quick. Um, I promised some pretty graphics and here you go. Um, so we are definitely getting some movement, on getting funds into IDIS and getting funds committed. But as you can see, we are still far behind on drawing and expending funds. So um, as you know, uh, there is a 20% uh, of your grant allocation has to be expended by September 30th, 2021. And that is not as far away as you think. Um, so if you are in need of any help, um, please reach out to your field office. Um, and I know that there are efforts going on to, to try and assist in that. If you can go to the next slide quickly. Um, the two allocations of funds, we are close to getting uh, most of the uh, round one allocation into IDIS, and we're still uh, a little ways away. About a third of our folks still don't have their um, funds in uh, IDIS yet. So we, we will be working with you to make that happen. Thanks. Thank you so much, Sharon. Uh, I also want to remind everyone, uh, if you are having trouble submitting your quarterly progress reports, uh, please reach out to someone. Uh, we are really relying on those QPRs uh, to be able to report what's going on, track what's going on, monitor, uh, and those kinds of things. And if we don't have them, it's kind of a bit of a problem. So uh, we want to be as helpful as we can and help you get those in. So if you're having trouble, please uh, reach out, uh, reach out to the our AAQ desk or help desk or uh, or your field office or SNAP staff, uh, and we'll we'll get you the help you need. Thank you very much. Uh, next, I am uh, very pleased to uh, go to our resource spotlight. We have some great resources uh, we want to talk about. So uh, Mary Frances Kenyon and Michelle Williams are two of our fantastic technical assistance providers, and they're going to talk about some of our resources related to equitable vaccine distribution and access. So with that, I'm gonna turn things over to Mary Frances. Thanks, uh, Norm. Uh, next slide, please. All right, so we've had some great presenters uh, on today's call. I just wanna spend a little bit of time talking about what can we do right now? Um, so there is a newsletter that will be coming out and it's an equity focused newsletter. Um, and after that concludes, there's gonna be a special series to follow. Um, we want folks to make sure that uh, you've familiarized yourself with state and local vaccine distribution plans uh, and just an acknowledgement that while some communities are not going to deviate from existing plans, uh, particularly in the Southeast region, um, people experiencing homelessness may be prioritized in current phases. So we should be working actively to ensure that they have uh, access to uh, the vaccine. Uh, another important piece is that we want communities to engage in dialogue around vaccine hesitancy um, so that folks experiencing homelessness and essential staff that work with those folks experiencing homelessness uh, can grow into willingness when there's a better supply uh, with the vaccine. Next slide, please. So we want to also give a preview of what you're gonna see in the newsletter. Uh, we're gonna spend some time focusing on the historical roots of public health and medical institution distrust, right? Um, as we continue to design strategies and resources in alignment with public health guidance in response to COVID-19, it's really important that everyone understands the root causes of distrust or uncertainty, uh, particularly the black, indigenous, other people of color, um, along with marginalized communities may hold about public health and healthcare systems. Next slide, please. So a really quick crash course in some history, and you'll see this in the newsletter. Um, this is around reproductive health and biomedical research and justice. So a lot of folks know about the Tuskegee experiments, they know about Henrietta Lacks, um, but we have a, a, a really deep and long history of uh, injustice in the health field uh, in our country. And so dating back to uh, the 1840s, right, there was gynecological experimentation without anesthesia on enslaved black women. Um, if you move up into 1909, that was the beginning of 
forced sterilization for people with disabilities, particularly those with intellectual and development disability, developmental disabilities, mental health challenges, um, that lasted for decades. Moving into 1937, uh, there was a U.S. law, Law 116 in Puerto Rico, uh, that really uh, spoke to eugenics, contraception, and sterilization that resulted in one in three uh, Puerto Rican women uh, who were married being unable to have children. Um, they were experimented on with contraceptives without their consent. Uh, moving right along to 1981, uh, again, the, the reoccurring theme of forced sterilization among Mexican-American women uh, in California. Um, there was a, a, a period of time in 1990 uh, up to 1994 where uh, the Abbasubai tribe members, DNA was used without their consent. They thought they were signing up for a study uh, about diabetes, which had a high prevalence among the tribal members. Um, and it ended up uh, being used in other genetic studies with, without their consent. And this isn't just history, right? Um, also, out of California, we have 150 female inmates in that state that were sterilized without their consent as a, par a part of the Department of Corrections. Um, and this has been, you know, fairly recently, 2006 to 2010. Um, I'll end with the, the 2020 allegations from a whistleblower, uh, a nurse at Irwin County ICE Detention Center um, that was seeing abnormalities with uh, hysterectomies happening on uh, relatively healthy patients. What do all of these things have in common? Uh, why is this important? It's important to know the history of why folks, uh, particularly black and brown folks, may be um, unwilling to engage with the public health systems or the medical systems, right? Because there's a history, of, a very well-documented history of uh, abuse and experimentation uh, and it has present day implications. Next slide, please. So as I said a moment earlier, the newsletter will be winding down after this week, but we're going to have a special series and we're going to highlight some more historical roots of public health and medical institution, institution distrust to really support the dialogue on uh, vaccine hesitancy. Um, so you can expect to learn more about the Asian American Pacific Islander community and health disparities they experience um, immigrants without legal presence and, and some uh, unique barriers they face to trusting medical systems. Um, also, some of those intersectional identities like the LGBTQ community, uh, folks with different abilities, and the nuances of navigating vaccine conversations uh, with, with folks who are in members of black and brown communities. Next slide. Uh, there are some great resources that are available right now. Um, you can take a look at uh, racial trauma and trauma-informed services, uh, staff orientation to racial equity, as well as racially equitable responses to COVID-19 as uh, uh, some starting points for communities that may be in different places uh, within their journey uh, of advancing racial equity within the homelessness system. And I think I'm going to turn it over to Michelle. Yep, thank you, Mary Francis. We're gonna um, just go quickly. We actually, I think, saw this uh, slide last week, but I just wanna continue to emphasize that while supply is extremely scarce in a lot of places, um, we're gonna see that, but that doesn't take away what we can do now to ensure that people who are uh, within our populations that we're serving that are eligible within those eligibility categories are really getting connected to the vaccine as quickly as possible and continuing to work with the range, the full range of healthcare partners. So you may not be getting traction with your Department of Public Health. I think we heard earlier that they're very busy. <laughs> they have a lot happening at the moment. And so reaching out to your federally qualified health centers, um, your private hospital, public hospitals in your community, healthcare for the homeless clinics, and even your local pharmacy uh, may be a way that you can work to uh, get people access immediately. Um, next slide. Uh, also, in the newsletter that's coming up, you'll see, again, more tools on building vaccine confidence. That's obviously the theme uh, that we're uh, all working towards, some information on language tools and how to communicate with people who may be hesitant. Uh, lots of resources uh, from the racial equity team on kind of um, historic reasons for uh, mistrust and hesitancy and some strategies to help you address that. We also are linking the updated um, CDC FAQs for people who are experiencing homelessness. Um, so 
uh, all of that uh, is available for you to look forward to. Next slide. Uh, in this newsletter as well, we have some uh, additional guidance for uh, homeless service providers and domestic violence, sexual assault, human trafficking uh, providers. You are, we are in probably in all um, of our programs serving people who have experienced uh, these things, and so we want to make sure that we're uh, paying attention to confidentiality and safety and trauma-informed support for survivors. So lots of information about how to connect with partners, um, how to plan for site safety, and of course, how to maintain uh, confidentiality and safety on information. And I believe that, that may be my last slide. Yes. Thank you. Thank you so much, Michelle. Thank you, Mary Frances. Uh, great content. Uh, so we're coming up to the end of our time here. Uh, uh, we're not going to have time for questions, but I do believe we got answers to all of the questions that came up in the chat window, or at least most of them. Uh, we'll put up the instructions for how to download the chat window. So if you want to just like download that whole chat and just be able to peruse it later in case you miss something, uh, I'd encourage you to do that. Uh, I, I want to thank all of our guests today, uh, just a lot of great content. So I want to thank uh, Dr. Furholden, uh, uh, our friends from Worcester, uh, uh, Leah Bradley, Dr. Castile, um, uh, Jack uh, Moran and, and James Brooks, and uh, definitely want to thank Mary Francis and Michelle. Uh, so great content. I, I also want to just sort of make a point here that, like, uh, we obviously are uh, in, very invested in this, uh, in, in, in proceeding in an equitable way, and we're going to keep doing this. Uh, I'd really encourage you to bring in, uh, you know, partners in your, that, that you work with into these conversations to share the materials we're producing. We're going to keep producing these materials and keep uh, having content on the uh, website. Uh, sorry, during our office hours. So I just I just want to express that we are uh, we're committed to this for the long term, and uh, strongly encourage you to be champions of equity in your communities. Uh, and if you have questions, uh, there's no question that's too basic or too simple or uh, whatever. Please reach out to us. Uh, we want to be partners with you in in doing this work. So again, I want to thank all of our presenters today. Thank the uh, team behind the scenes that was uh, keeping this all running smoothly. Uh, one of the deep appreciation for the snappers who were uh, answering questions and who have uh, pushed forward this content all along. Uh, and I want to thank everyone. I especially want to just uh, our hearts go out to our friends in Texas and other parts of the South that are that are struggling right now. Uh, if you have uh, any, if there's any technical assistance or any assistance we can provide, please reach out. Uh, we have emailed out to as many of the uh, COCs as we can, and um, and you know we, we we can't fix everything, but we if if there's something you think we can help with, please reach out. Uh, we are standing by. Uh, so thank you all so much. Hope you enjoy the rest of your day. Have a great weekend. And that is the end of the webinar.